My name is Christoph Pettis. I work for a company called PostgreSQL Experts. We're a boutique Postgres consultancy based up in San Francisco, and um, we're a sponsor. Take one of the flyers that's uh, from us that's around there. Uh, it, they're, they're great Christmas gifts. Um, let's see, just a quick rundown. Um, my personal blog is thebuild.com. The slides for this presentation are available for download there. Um, because you desperately need our help for something, I'm sure, uh, go to postgreskillexperts.com. You can follow me on Twitter at, um, X, at XOF, and there's my email address. So, um, hello. So, <clears throat> what we're going to be talking about is PCI compliance, which is one of those terms that everybody like throws around. It's just always that PCI compliant. Remember, you have to be PCI compliant. If you don't, if you don't eat your vegetables, PCI compliance will get you in the middle of the night. So. Which, so PCI is the Payment Card Industry Security Standards Council, which is a, bu a bureaucracy that was set up, I don't remember exactly how long ago, when people realized that people stole credit card numbers. And now that we were keeping um, credit card numbers on computers that were connected to the internet, you could see a lot of credit card numbers in a very short amount of time. And there were no standards for how you had to secure these. So um, a bunch of worthies from Visa and MasterCard and people all sat down and came up with this, the security standard. So if you process a payment card, so if you touch cardholder information, you have to comply with this. Specifically, you have to comply with this document that's called PCI-DSS, the Data Security Standard. So there's a document that you can go and download, which I strongly suggest that you do if you're in this position, and read it, because it makes for very grim, um, terrifying reading. Um, the most recent version is 3.1, which was updated in April 2015. So why do we care about this? Well, you know, we all want to get paid, and the way people pay for stuff online is by a credit card. I assume, has, when was the last time any, I like, have lost all my checkbooks? I, I don't remember checks now. Um, so if you touch payment card information, you have to comply with the PCI, full stop. You have to comply with all of it, no exceptions. This is one of the first myths, is the idea that we're a small site, so we, can, we don't have to comply with everything. No, you have to comply with every single bullet item in the entire specification if you touch one credit card number. If anyone needs to send a text to their boss right now, well, I'll wait. Um, so what does it mean to comply with this standard? You know, and what's interesting is, you'd think, given how grim and important the standard is, whether or not you're in compliance would be like a really obvious question, but it's not. It's actually a little bit vague. Really what compliance means is that you passed an audit. Now, this is where, if you're a small, and I won't go into the details of the various tiers, but it's basically based on how much, how, how much credit card activity you process. Small sites can self-evaluate. So you can tell yourself, yes, we're compliant. Right here sitting right now, you can say, I'm compliant, and sign a piece of paper, and you're done. So that's really easy compliance. You know, hope you're right, but, um, but even if you have to self-audit, you have to comply with every part of PCI. So you have to go through and honestly ask yourself all these questions. And we'll talk about what these questions are and how, from a Postgres perspective, you comply with them. So if you take out your credit card and there's this number on the front, it's you know 16 digits. I'm, can, I can remember when 12 digits were okay. In the case of, a, of an American Express card, it's 15 digits. That's called a primary account number in, in PCI ease. If you ever touch that, and by touch I mean your code ever manipulates this number, you have to comply with PCI. That's the gateway. It doesn't matter if you take just somebody's name or something like that. Interestingly enough, if you even take the, the expiration date but not the number, I'm not sure what you do, why you do that, but you, you, that doesn't trigger compliance. But if you ever touch that account number, you do have to comply. Even if you don't store it in the database. So even if you just accept it and hand it off to some other service, you do have to comply with PCI. However, if you never write it in the database, your life got a lot easier in terms of what you, of, of your information security. So, so if you comply, you're safe, right? You know, you've, you've done, you've gone, they say, uh, the auditor said, hands you a piece of paper that said, we did, it, we did the audit and everything's fine. And the answer is no, you're never safe. There is no safety this side of the grave. Um, Passing the audit just means you're allowed to process credit card information. It doesn't mean you're released in any way from any liability. 
So if you have a breach, you can have passed the audit yesterday and, be, and have gone through every item in the checklist and you are still completely liable for every dollar lost because of that breach, forever. So this is why it, it, you don't want to just sign the piece of paper and self-certify. And self, and self you want to actually make sure your systems are secure. So what are we going to talk about in this talk? Because PC, you know, full PCI compliance is a huge topic. We're just going to talk about what you need to do for a Postgres database for PCI compliance. Um, there's a lot more involved in getting your whole system front to back PCI compliant, and there are lots of people who can help you with that, including PGX. Um, one of the things I like about PCI, and I don't like much about PCI, is it's a good jumping off point for general system security, for, to get you thinking about what it takes to, to secure a system. So first of all, read the documentation. Go and get and read a copy of uh, PCI DSS. We're, we're not gonna grind through the whole thing and all of its bullet points here because we'd be here for years. Um, so we're gonna focus on the technical matters as related to a database. But PCI goes into policies and procedures that are far beyond just the database. So make yourself familiar with those if you're in the situation that you have to deal with this stuff. Um, and this is the absolute minimum you need to do for PCI compliance. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll pass an audit. So you know, please don't send me a hostile email saying, well, I did everything you said in your talk and we still flunked the audit. Because that's, this is the starting point, not the end point. So yes, this is the start of your journey, not the end. So PCI has six areas with 12 specific requirements. These are top level bullet points in PCI. Um, each one of these means something for Postgres and we'll talk about what it means for each one. Uh, so let's go through each one, it'll be great, you'll love it. This is gonna be so much fun. Okay, so on we go. The first requirement is you have to have firewalls. The specific wording is you have to install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect cardholder data. That's what PCI says. What it really means in this section is, in general, that, a, the server only, that any server that's running that, has card, that ever processes cardholder data offers only the minimum level of service to the public, to, to the public internet that it has to. So don't run your IRC server on a PostgreSQL box. You laugh, I have seen this. Um, so. Your Postgres server is just running PostgreSQL and only that. In terms of, you know, obviously, it's fine to run net, you know, NT, um, NTP and things that are necessary to keep a server happy, but don't run your mail server. Don't run your, you know, any run, your Usenet server. Don't run other stuff on the box. And for definitely don't run your application server on the same box as your, as your, um, as your database. <clears throat> Basically, make sure only port 5432 is available. Don't have an FTP port, don't have, I, you know, unencrypted FTP on a database server that has credit card information, not so hot. Um, and make sure you restrict access to it using IP tables or whatever your favorite infrastructure is to only the application servers that have to talk to the database. Don't have port 5432 just hanging out into space, being uh, publicly accessible to any comer. There was, in fact, a Postgres security bug that allowed somebody to bring down your, your database server um, and damage data in it, without, even if they didn't have a valid login on your box, if they were able to get to 5432. It's been patched, but this stuff does happen. So first, use pgahpa.conf. Who knows what this file is? Most people, great, okay. Use it to restrict traffic to authorized IPs and make sure SSL is on for real. Make sure SSL is required, not just, um, not just desired in the pghba.conf. And run IP tables or something else to make sure that, no, that, that um, incoming traffic is restricted. Don't allow direct logins to the, um, to the database host. Um, the implicit phrase is here, from, the, from your general infrastructure. Obviously, at some point, somebody needs to be able to log in or you can never maintain the box. But require a hop through a bastion host, especially if you're allowing people who are remote and not in a, in a single office infrastructure. And you know who works that way anymore? Nobody does. Um, so don't allow people to just SSH in straight from the public internet into your box. Use a VPN. Don't trust bare SSH, even on a non-standard port. I mean, yes, it's great if you move SSH from port 22 to port 1000. You know, and what's funny is that people say, we're going to move it to a non-standard port. And the, that non-standard port always ends in 22. 
is like, uh, you know, it really is like, I know we'll paint the, the curb red in front of the buildings and the terrorists won't park there. You know, come on guys, think of something more interesting than 1,022 for your, or 10,022 for your non-standard report. You know, roll dice or something. Okay, requirement number two is security, is about security policies. Don't use vendor supplied defaults for system passwords. I mean, you know, dull, but you'd be surprised. Um, how many people know what the standard, the default, um, have changed all the passwords on all their routers? How about on all of their Wi-Fi boxes? How about on that cable box that provides the public internet access to your office? Do you know what the, uh, the password is on that? And look, Postgres comes, ships complete with a vendor supplied password in the form of no password at all to the Postgres user. So you have to make sure that the Postgres user has a password. Um, so go into your pghp.conf, forget that trust authentication mode ever existed. Pretend that it is, um, just banish it from your vocabulary. There is, you cannot ever use trust authentication mode on a secure system, full stop. The, the, the weakest you could possibly use is ident, or I'm sorry, not ident, I didn't say that, uh, peer. I think I say ident here at one point and I should fix that. Um, Always require specific users, even super users. No one should ever be logging into the Postgres account. The only re is that you should give each individual human being, not a role, but a person, a super user account to do uh, changes to the database. Very, very few installations actually do this, but this is required by PCI. Don't use the Postgres Unix or database user. Require specific users to go in and muck with the database. One thing you can do with this is LDAP. I put LDAP, I put quotes around friend in LDAP for anyone who's ever actually managed LDAP server. But you can, but having centralized management of these users is extremely helpful. For, when you're administering the system, specific users in sudo never ever have root login. Ever, ever, ever. The user, the root, lo the root user should never be used to log into the box. Use a password manager, some way of managing these passwords because you're going to have a gazillion of them. Again, LDAP is great if you don't, if you could, um, to set up the infrastructure. Um, now, sometimes you, you're going to have super critical passwords, like you know, the system will have a root password no matter what. I guess you could revoke it, but you probably don't want to. One thing that you need to do then is, I strongly recommend that you take the password, rip it in half, and give two different people who don't like each other very much copies. Um, you know, don't give like the two, you know, the two best friends who you hired from the same company. Maybe don't give them both halves of the password, because there will be times that in an absolute disaster you need to, you need to do this. For example, your system administrator just quit with no notice. But, so, but have some kind of custody situation so that it needs participation of multiple people in order to unlock it. This is just like a safe with a key and a combination. This is what banks do, you know. Banks are kind of grown-ups when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, this is going to be, this is, um, so as far as PCI is concerned, versions of transport level security less than 1.2 don't exist anymore. They are not considered secure. They, you might as well be running in the clear. So. For anything that's going to manipulate credit card information, including your, your public-facing website where the user types in the credit card number, you have to require um, TLS 1.2. You cannot allow them to use 1.1, which breaks a lot of browsers. To which PCI says, this is the world's smallest violin playing for you. Um, so they've, they, <laughs> what's funny is about every month I get a new update that says, um, we've just bumped this date at this compliance date out by a month. So now it's June 2016. It used to be September. It was going to be June 2015. So I guess they they have heeded the call of how many browsers this will break. But I suspect it's not going to change after this. So be prepared to change your SSL config to to ban anything less than 1.2 as of that date. Um, Make sure that somebody subscribes to and actually reads the P, the the announce list on Postgres, so you know about new security um, updates because those do happen. Um, 
and always immediately apply any security-related re updates. It's really depressing when I log into a Postgres machine that's supposedly very secure and very important, and it's running Postgres 922. You know, come on, guys. <laughs> you can do better than that. Um, and make sure you're on the Debian or Ubuntu or CentOS or whatever security announcement list so you're getting, kernel up, you're getting um, announcements about your distro. And you know, don't, please don't rely on you happen to see something on Twitter, you know, for whether or not you, you need to. Uh, there's a CVE out that that affects you, and keep up to date with your patches. Have a plan to do this, not just oh yeah. When was the last time I patched the database server? Um, what you need to do is you need to make it somebody's job, and you need to make sure they do it. You know, it has to it has to fall upon somebody or some group of somebodies. And they have to have pinned on the wall, you must follow this update procedure and this update schedule. And if a, a critical security patch goes unheeded, never ignore it because probably there are already exploits out there floating around. Because usually the way people find out about this is they found, uh, somebody found an exploit first. Ever, ever, ever. Okay. Now we get to the big requirement. This is what, when everyone says PCI compliance, the immediate thing they, the immediately thing, thing they think is, well, this means encryption, right? Well, and it does. And that's requirement number three, data security. Protect stored car holder data. Okay, got it. It's protected. Um, you know, at last, finally, database stuff. Um, so this is usually everyone's first solution, is they say, no problem, we just install Lux, which if people don't know, it's a full, full, it's a full volume encryption, um, software encryption thing that layers on top and encrypts a whole volume for you. You type in a passphrase to unlock it. And uh, it's, we run that on top of um, LVM and we run on EBS and the thing performs about as fast as a, as a USB key, but we're secure, right? No, you are not secure. You have not complied. Um, Full disk encryption is useless. Let me say that again. Full disk encryption is useless, okay? It's good for laptops, it's good for USB keys, it's good for portable hard disks, it is useless for servers. Useless, useless, useless. Because full disk encryption protects you against exactly one problem, which is theft of the media. Somebody you know, dressed like the Hamburglar walks into your data center and yanks a disk out. How often does this happen, really? I don't know but not very often. All these big security breaches you hear about, about Target, about Ashley Madison, about all these guys, none of them happened that way. Somebody did not sneak in and rip off a hard disk. They did it by logging into the database and running, P you know, they used PSQL or the equivalent thereof and dumped all the data. And full disk encryption by definition will not guard you against that because if, you, if the database couldn't read the, um, the data, it can't run. So, the rule is if PSQL, if you could log in the database, run PSQL and see it in clear text, it's not secure. So full disk encryption will not help you here. I mean, if you use it anyway, it's not going to hurt anything except your performance, but it is not, so it is not sufficient to, to keep your data secure. Always per column encrypt the data. Encrypt the specific columns that are sensitive. Um, you get better performance also on this, and it's much higher security. One of the problems, of course, is key management is a pain here. Um, and key management is a very complicated topic that's a little beyond the scope here. But you do need to figure out a way of managing the key that's going to decrypt all of this stuff. Usually, this means keeping it in memory in your application server somewhere in a place that it's probably, that it's going to be hard to get to by an intruder. Um, one of the downsides, that the thing that people always fight with about key management is how do we automatically reboot the database unattended? And the answer is you can't. You, a, a pager has to go off and a human being with access to the key has to go in and unlock the data. That's just what you're signing up for, for data this sensitive. It sucks. Especially being, speaking as the person who frequently has his pager go off, it sucks. But you have to assume a human being will be in the loop. Because any, um, any key that's kept someplace that can, is accessible during an automatic reboot is easily accessible to an intruder into the system. So the main thing you need to protect is the primary account number. That's that 16-digit number on the front of the card. Um, you know, so that has to be encrypted. You have to use a well-known secure algorithm. They, um, AES is generally considered good enough. 
Um, you can use other algorithms as long as you can make a convincing case that's at least as good as AES. You know, this is like everyone's rule in life is don't roll your own crypto because you'll get it wrong, you know. Um, and you can't bake the keys into code or store them in repositories. This seems obvious, but oh my gosh, how many config files are out there with secret key, e with secret underscore key equals number, you know. Um, I do a lot of Django development. I love Django, and Django is terrible at this because the default settings file does exactly that. It's icky. Um, so everybody, know, everybody who's ever bought anything online has seen the, your Visa card ending in you know, 6321 or whatever. Um, that's called the basked number, which is it's a subset of all the digits. PCI lets you show the first six and last four of the pan for display purposes, so you can keep that much in the database if you want. Um, really just keep the last four. Uh, there's kind of no reason to keep all of it. Um, the reason it's the first six is that lets you identify the kind of card and the, and the bank that issued it, but you know, don't worry about it. Uh, I, you, rarely do you need to know that Citibank issued the card. Um, the reason that only keeping the last four is that you can also store a hash of the card number. This is a very common technique, because, uh, one, a, a unidirectional hash, because frequently a customer service representative has to get a, get a credit card number, type it in, and search on it. And on an encrypted field, there's no way to do that. With a one-way hash, you can then one-way hash the, the value that was entered and search on that index field. Great technique, but be careful with your hash function. If you're using MD5 and they have the first six and last four digits of your number, it'll take them about 35 seconds on a modern GPU, and that number is that's probably an overestimation on my part to pull the credit card numbers out. So don't do that. Um, use a really strong hash, like you know, SSJ512. I mean, really, you know, computational complexity is not what you should be worrying about here. Just throw the biggest hash that you, can, you have a library for at the problem. <clears throat> so um, people familiar with PG Crypto? Um, it's a contrib module. It ships with Postgres, but it's an extension. You have to install it yourself. Um, and it contains cryptography functions. And Every single time people say, well, why don't I just use that to encrypt the pan? I mean, it's just sitting there. You know, this is nice hash function there. You know, the, it does do strong encryption. It, um, <clears throat> it's layered on top of a variety of other libraries like OpenSSL. So any ciphers that are available in that library, you can get at that way. I mean, you know, the library's just sitting there. So let's think what this would look like. Um, it would look something like, well, we're just going to insert this number in there and insert into my super secret table with the, with the card number and this value. And what's in your text logs now? Why the unencrypted card number? What happened? And you say, well, I would never do that. Yeah, and then you, turn, you set log, log um, min statement duration to zero because you're trying to debug a, a connection problem. And suddenly, all these numbers are appearing in your text logs. So don't do that. This is the problem with, using, with encrypting at the database level. Um, so. And this is another hop between the application server and the database server that the pan has to take in clear text, and every hop is kind of a problem. Obviously, you have to secure that link, but you know, come on. So my recommendation is always, always, always do the, uh, the encryption of the application, not the database. This is not specifically required by PCI, but I feel it's the right thing to do. I hate the term best practice, but it's, uh, I, think it's, I think it's wise to encrypt it in the application and, store it, and, have, and just store an encrypted blob <clears throat> into the database. So let's see what this would look like. Well, oops, come on. So here's a sample schema. You know, you, I like UUIDs. I love UUIDs. Use them for everything. Clean my bathtub with them. Um, and so we have a UUID, and there's a mass, and here's our mass card number, last four digits. And here's the hash of it that I generated using you know, some nice function. And here's the encrypted pan. It's a byte egg because it's just this big encrypted blob. And here's the encrypted CVV. Now, everyone, do people know what the, what the CVV on a credit card is? Remember all these times they say, what are, turn your card over and get the last, three, the, the last three digits on the signature panel. That's the CVV. Or because American Express has to be different, it's the four numbers on the front of the card for American Express. So we'll encrypt that too. 
because obviously that sounds pretty sensitive, and the expiration date, because the expiration date you do not have to encrypt under PCI, that, that you can store that in clear text. Okay, so what's wrong with this schema? Seems pretty. Everything's okay with this except you can't store the CVV. This is the number one thing everyone gets wrong in data modeling on, on, da on this. On. It always pains me when people say, I see these web forms where you have to type in the CVV and, I know that, and they say, well, we're gonna charge you five weeks later because I know they're breaking, PC, they're breaking their PCI compliance. You can't store it at all, not even encrypted. You can, well, that's almost true. You can store it, but only until you've run the authorization. And you have to run the authorization immediately. You can't defer authorization if you're storing it. So, okay, that's fine. We'll just store, you know, because you can imagine that it goes into the database and then there's a background process that runs authorizations and it picks it up and it runs the authorization. And then we'll just click null it out, throw it away. Okay, problem solved, right? So about your Postgres secondary, um, with all those wall logs that are being backed up, or the backup job that happened to run before that queue was cleared out, um, because no storage means no storage, not in wall segments, not in backups, not in text logs, even in encrypted form. PCI is very explicit about this because the, the theory behind the CVV was it proved you had the card in your hand. Of course, then merchants all went and did this stuff and now it proves nothing of the sort, but they're still clinging to this fond hope that it proves that the card is present. So you can't do that ever. So unless you're going to run the authorization immediately in the, in the application server, not in the database, don't even ask for the CVV. Just don't write it to the database. See, that's easy. So requirement number four is encrypt the data in flight. Um, encrypt the transmission of cardholder data across open public networks. You know, I, I hope you're doing that. Come on. You know, generally, these days, we're kind of entering this um, SSL. I, I, you know, the SSL is, has an unfortunate dual meaning. One is the generic class of, of protocols, including TLS and SSL, and one is the old SSL protocol. So, and, some, and, and this is an unfortunate mishmash of the term SSL. But we're kind of entering this world where every website, even sites that are not super secure, are, um, are SSL required. So just go with that. If you're processing credit card data, just make sure that no, just always redirect to your secure site and don't even, you know, just even show the catalog pages if you're an e-commerce site. And remember, you can't use old style SSL or TLS 1.0 or 1.1 anymore. Um, use SSL <laughs> for Postgres. Require SSL connections to Postgres. Remember, if you're using PG Bouncer, use Stunnel, because PG Bouncer doesn't speak SSL on either side of its connections, so you're gonna have to use Stunnel to route these connections. Um, in a perfect world, use certificate management, so you actually issue proper certificates to all your clients. Um, that's, I think, the right thing to do. It's a pain in the neck because you have to set up your own certificate authority or do that kind of thing, but it's worth the pain. I would strongly encourage you to do that. Requirement number five, protect against malware. Um, so this is what it requires. Protect all systems against malware or regularly update antivirus software programs. Um, <clears throat> specifically what they're worried about are work machines that are accessing the database, like your CSRs, desktop machines, um, your developers' machines, because this is actually how large-scale breaches tend to happen. If somebody gets a keylogger or, gets, gets, um, or is able to intrude into a PC and hop to the database from there. So assuming you believe what Ashley Madison's corporate, corporate said, that's how this intrusion happened. It's possible, of course, it was just a DBA who did a dump, but you know, this is how they say it happened, and this is plausible. Um, so <laughs> this is not literally what it says in the PCI, but um, basically the requirement on number six is develop and maintain secure systems and applications. Um, this means kind of run your business <laughs> the way you know, everyone says you should, um, not like most startups are run these days. So document your security administra systems administration procedures, do code reviews and audits, make sure you have real deployment procedures, make sure you have rollback procedures on, on everything in case you push something out and there's a bug. Um, you know, I understand the pleasures of continuous integration and continuous deployment and things like that, but it does create this situation that things, that, <clears throat> um, 
that you do pushes, and the next thing you know is because all your monitoring lights went red. Oh, I guess we had a bug somewhere. You know, don't use your users as your beta test fleet. Um, specifically, just to get it back to databases, um, requirement 651, as you can see, there are lots of requirements in each of these sections, says make sure you, can't, you are invulnerable to SQL injection attacks. Um, so when you're using, whatever library you use to integrate with Postgres, make sure you're using proper per parameter um, um, substitution. Don't build SQL by text substitution, because that's how you get these parameter injection attacks. There are times that you have to, like for example, if you're writing scripts that, that manipulate tables and you need a variable table name, Parameter substitution can only substitute, can't substitute for structural parts of, this, of the SQL, like the command itself or like the table name. So you have to do text substitution there, but for the parameters on an insert or on a select, make sure that you are using parameter substitution, not just plain text expansion. Just remember, all user input is hostile and wants to kill you. You know, it's knives and pins and sharp things coming in from the internet. Assume the worst of anything that comes in from a website. Um, so re requirement seven is restrict data by need to know. Um, so only people who must touch cardholder data, such as CSRs who are entering orders or searching for customer orders, um, uh, need uh, have access to it. So th one of the things this means, and in the DevOps world this can be a big problem, is don't give every developer production machine access. Don't let, don't let de developers just be able to log into the machine and dump their credit card numbers. You'd be amazed how many systems are like this. Um, and make sure that you know who can do what to your systems. This can be, you know, in a, in a fast moving startup, this can be a problem because you, know, you just are sort of like handing out credentials and hoping for the best. But you have to slow down and kind of do things the right way. Because the number one question that's gonna be asked on any breach is well, who did it? And you need to be able to answer that question. And if the answer is any of your developers could, that's not a great answer. Um, and if you use um, production data for development or staging testing, make sure you scrub it. Don't have hot credit card numbers in there. You know. But, and this can be more challenging than it sounds because for example, what if you have a unique constraint on the credit card number? You know. Uh, or the hash of it. So now you have to come up with a bunch of them. You can't just use four 15 ones as the credit card number. So whatever you're doing with passwords now, you're probably doing it wrong as far as PCI is concerned. Um, the, the top level thing is identify and authenticate access to system components, but it's really specific about this. User accounts must be associated with a particular human being, not a role, okay? You have, it has to be, you know, S, you know, it, it has to be S. Smith, not DBA, that logs into the box. You have to log out, lock out accounts after more than six attempts. This is every account on the system, including Unix shell access. How many people do this? I, I don't, <laughs> you know. How do, you know um, and when a user's terminated, it has to be immediately revoked. Like, while they're sitting with HR, you're pulling the plug. System passwords must be complex. Um, you know, the usual, you know, has to include, you know, three, three, three uppercase letters, two lowercase letters, a digit, and a blood sample um, kind of thing. But, but you have to enforce it. You can't just put, say, please do that. It has to, the, the code has to reject passwords that are not complex. And has to be changed at least every 90 days. They have to expire. Um, and you have to encrypt them in transmission. And this is a great one. This is, I have flunked more companies on this one. Um, you, you have to record the last four and make sure that the new password isn't the same as any of the last four, including shell access. Hui. Um, and now, as of 3.1, two-factor authentication is required. So you have to have at least two of these, a password or passphrase, a physical device or a smartphone app, or a biometric device for access to a system that holds, um, that, that touches account information. Machines that don't touch account information or, um, don't, are, don't, are, don't have to be this strict. But this includes your, your front-end application servers that includes the database. What fun. Sessions, when you actually are connected to the machine, they must be logged, including user activity during the session. You have to know what everyone did. And 
they have to be terminated after being idle for 15 minutes. This 15 minutes is called out specifically in PCI, interestingly enough. All these numbers are, are called out in PCI as specific requirements. You can be more aggressive than this, of course, but you can't be less. For Postgres, basically what you want to do is make sure each user has its own unique account, log all the connections and disconnections to the box, logs all activity by directly connecting users. Um, you don't have to log everything that happens that the web server does necessarily uh, um, if you have that log information someplace else, but you do have to log all the activity by directly connecting users. One nice trick here is you can turn um, log statement to all and set that on the users so that when they log in, suddenly everything's being logged. And don't permit login users as a Postgres super user. It's fine to have super users, just, po just don't have the generic Postgres account be available. So requirement number nine is you have to restrict physical access to the machine. Um, you mean it means real security like access controls, video, a man trap. Um, you know, having worked in bank um, vaults, that's the one where you walk in, the, the door closes behind you, you put your thing down, you put your hand down, you enter a code and you go back in. It's all very impressive. Not bad for something that's just handling, you know, credit cards. Um, on your server room. Um, of course, you're probably hosting in a data center, so make sure your cloud provider provides this for the cloud they are providing to you. And requirement number 10 is basically log everything. You know, it's track and monitor all access to network resources, data, cardholder data, all that stuff. Um, make sure everything is logged and the logs are kept secure and can't be tampered with. So I love just dumping raw CSV logs into my Postgres machine and that's totally not PCI world. Um, use our syslog or something that ships the logs off the system. And this is the important part. Make sure you can trace the log record back to an individual person. If somebody did a, DB, a, a, a PG dump and took a copy of your database, make sure you know who did that. Not just an account, but an individual that did it. But remember that you can't log the PAN or the CVVs in clear text. So this is another good reason to encrypt in the application, not just in the database. And 11 is regularly test all your processes. Um, hire an external penetration testing firm and encourage your developers to poke at the security on this. I mean, not to the destruction of your production environment, of course, but you know, make, everyone, make everyone feel like this being secure is really important. Um, and also, when you hire a PCI audit company, um, Hire ones that actually understand security, not just ones that push a button and run a pen test against a particular IP address. Um, I had this kind of unedifying conversation. I, was, um, I had hired a company to do a penetration test because the gateway I was using required this particular company. We, always a bad sign. Um, and so the, and the next thing I do, I get a call that says, we need you to turn off your firewall. What? I thought this was about security. And they say, uh, so why? I says, well, our, our test is failing because we can't get through the firewall. <laughs> Which kind of sounds like what a firewall is supposed to do, right? I mean, they, and they, would, they were going to flunk me for this. Basically, they were saying, well, we couldn't get through the, the front gate on your apartment complex, so we couldn't make sure your door was locked. It's like, so work with a company that actually understands PCI. It doesn't just run pen test scripts. Pen testing is great, and be sure to do that. And, you know, go to another machine and run Nmap on um, on your, on your servers, you know, one of the, the most important things is you need to think like a, a burglar, not, not like an upstanding citizen, so go to another location, you know, go to a Starbucks, install Nmap on your, uh, and run it against every IP in your machine, because you can be surprised what's sitting there open and waving in the, in the, waving in the breeze, but may, also make sure that whoever you're hiring for compliance actually understands your security model. And the last requirement, write everything down. You have to maintain a policy that addresses information security, so make sure the procedures are documented, policies are set, do proper risk assessment. This is a huge topic, not going to go into it, but it does require all this. And you know, really you should be doing this for your database anyway. Um, remember that when systems fail, they fail at three in the morning, and you're gonna be operating on no sleep and like two cups of instant coffee. You'll want as much information as possible to get the system back up. That's just a part of that. So there is an appendix, and everyone uses it in PCI called Appendix B, which I call the bargaining stage of grief. You know, you're going through the Kubler-Ross phases, now you've reached bargaining. It's like, no, no, what if I do this instead? Um, because sometimes you really can't comply. 
with, with the exact wording of the PCI spec, because the PCI spec is kind of ridiculous and is intended for giant banks. Um, so Appendix B allows you to write up this thing which is called a compensating control. Basically it says, we can't do exactly what the standard says, but we can do this, which is just as good. Um, you do have to write it up and document it, but for example, you may not be able to manage root on all of your systems by LDAP. For example, if you're on AWS, that's not happening. So what you can do is, you can say, well, we'll block root login and just use sudo for everything once the instance is provisioned and before, it, before any sensitive information lands on it. And that's actually, an that's actually what they use as the example in PCI DSS is this specific case. So you can do this. Um, just remember, it's not a get out, get out free jail card. If you don't need an external auditor, it's between you and your conscience and your insurance company, whether this compensating control is any good. If you use an external auditor, they have to sign off on these. So don't be silly with them. Make sure that the, you really are staying just as secure. The idea is that you're doing something that is just as secure in your environment as what PCI requires. So now, at the end of this, you're probably thinking, oh my god, and you should be. How, we, we, no one can ever comply with this. Honestly, in my opinion, major, th there are two major credit card brands. I have experience with one of them. They're not compliant. And they have every single one of their credit card brands start. So you, if you're thinking they can't comply, how can we comply? You're probably right. So you're probably thinking we're doomed. Um, it's a lot of work to, for full and correct PCI compliance. Um, and there's a huge downside risk. Um, and you know, the problem is, if there's a breach, the, you can be liable for every single penny that the bank and the consumers lose due to this. You know that, we, we, that, that you know, when, they, when you get your credit card statement and you say, ooh, I didn't charge that, you call the bank, and the bank says, oh sure, we'll just reverse it. That lands on the merchant. If there's been a big, um, it doesn't land on the bank. You know, banks don't take risks, that's not their job. Bank's job is to move the risk to somebody else, and that somebody else is you. So, but there is hope, and this, this took like 100 million years. Um, I was hoping we could get something like this in, like, this like in 2003, but finally we're getting this, which is, um, remember that if you don't touch the primary um, account number, you, you don't have to comply with PCI. So if you never actually process, handle the credit card number directly, um, the first steps were things like PayPal. This was like PayPal's big thing. It's like you, you, that, but then you have to kind of use PayPal, which is nuanced. I have nuanced views on PayPal, let's just say. And it's not suitable for every environment. So now we're finally getting a better solution, which is tokenization. Finally, took long enough. Um, in tokenization, you hand the pan, or you send them to another website which handles this, which is the best possible solution, and you get back a token. This token is not considered a primary account number because it's only good for you, for usually for a limited amount of time, usually as a single shot authorization. So PCI doesn't comply. And as long as you never store the PAN in your database, even temporarily, um, it, and it transfers the PCI headache onto them, which is exactly what you want. Because you want it to be their headache, not yours. Um, there's one big gotcha, which is so there are some interfaces that don't return the token without actually trying to run the card. So you have, when you shove, you, um, they're intended for second uses, you know, like subscriptions and things like that. So you have to run a charge on the card, but you may not want to run the charge right then. Like let's say you're, you, you only charge the card when the, the order ships or something like that. Um, so you need to do the authorization immediately because if you store the PAN back in the database, even for a short time, you're back in PCI compliance world. So this is something to be careful when you're evaluating the API, uh, various APIs. Um, the biggest, the, probably the, the one everyone's the most familiar with these days is Stripe. Stripe has a really nice API. It's kind of sophisticated, it's kind of complicated, but this is a complicated area of technology. Um, and Stripe does pretty much all the right things. You can do, you can get a, a token back without, um, without having to run an authorization. You can get a multi-use token, they call it a customer ID, um, that lets you charge for subscriptions and things like that. I have no connections to Stripe, they aren't even clients of ours, but I really like them. They're what we use to take credit cards on PGX's site. Um, CyberSource, um, which is kind of a huge, messy API, um, 
but they, they've now introduced a tokenization solution, which is a little Baroque, but it works. Um, MasterCard, interestingly enough, runs their own. Um, I have no direct experience with it. I've just read the API docs, but it seems plausible. Um, and so if you can use this, you're much better off than having to comply with PCI. Um, because once this is all done and you're all this, you can move on to worrying about HIPAA. <laughs> but that's another talk. Um, any questions? I've stunned everyone into silence. Good. Yes, sir. Well, um, you need the typical model is all the encrypt. Well, typical. I, I, how typical it is. The the one I like. Let's be is that the user signs on on the website. They type in their credit card number. You pick up the credit card number inside your application server. You know, there's a post, a, a web post comes in. You have this incredibly hot radioactive 16-digit number. Immediately encrypt it into into the byte string, pulling out the hash part if you need to, and that's what goes into the database. Um, this does mean it had to get the, there. Now, there was one big hand wave there, which is it had to get the key from somewhere. Yeah. Um, generally, what you need, what I prefer to do is store it in an in memory thing like memcached, making sure I've really locked down that memcached port, um, and require that that be entered when the application, when the system boots. Um, there's really no intelligent key management. There are, unless you're willing to kind of go crazy with this stuff. It's hard to do key management that doesn't, that doesn't ultimately involve a human being typing something in on system boot. Because anything that anything the system can read on boot, an attacker can read on boot, basically. That, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Anything else? That's us. Last plug. <laughs> and thank you very much for coming.